We are the victims of our colonizers, but we are the champions of our colonizers. Damn. We alienate ourselves from our languages. Hectic. And uh, let me start off by this example. The first way we alienate our, ourselves from our example, from our languages, is <laughs> we anthropologize our languages or, or exotify oh our languages. And thank you so much for tuning into Bad Nihilus. Today I've got the brilliant, intelligent Akatutu Oti. When he describes himself, he is a language practitioner. He doesn't want the word linguist. But was actually like about why he does not want to be called a language practitioner. Why is that? Before I even get into this topic. Okay, so I want to be called a language practitioner and not a linguist. Yes. And it's not that I'm running away from being a linguist because, I mean, you can't engage in language and not be a linguist. But really, it's from a very technical point of view that right. I don't want to call myself a linguist because as somebody who came through academia, uh -huh. you become a linguist through finishing your training. So I haven't finished my training <laughs> up to a PhD level. But if you could speak about linguistics in a layman's, ter in layman's terms and the work I do, then I guess you could say that. But language practitioner, I think, de uh, describes perfectly what I do. Yeah, yeah. And you're still pursuing a career in linguistics. There you go. Okay, I understand that. Galobu, we're not all familiar with this field and it's quite an interesting one. I'm so excited that you wrote this piece. Aka has written a piece and it's titled Zen King Gomo Makwalandini Thoughts on the Ultimate Archive of All Time. And briefly, actually I don't even think I should describe it because it's a it's such a an interesting introduction into the idea of language being so entrenched in who we are and our identities as people. <coughs> and I'm just going to invite Aka to tell us firstly about why you wrote this piece before we get into the meat of this. Okay, cool. Um, uh, okay, it's fine, because I wanted to make some disclaimers, but I can make them after what you Make them, okay. sure. We can get back to this. Okay. So the first disclaimer is that I'm really trying not to make this an academic conversation. It like, can't be. You know what I mean? And as a result of that, that, the ideas that are going to be discussed here from people who are well informed of these issues, they will, they will identify big um, gaps. Okay. Understandably so, because the intention of this conversation is to bring these ideas to the fore for everybody to understand Fair but enough. not necessarily to sound like I'm in a lecture hall no and that's the whole point of bad night is we disclose this from the jump between it's not an academic platform we have experts but they're trying to make this conversation more accessible so do expect big gaps which i can engage people get who are interested at another time mm. second um uh disclaimer these are not my ideas ideas that i'm very much interested in and i'm engaging them but i mean they've been put out there before by many great scholars right right so they're not necessarily my ideas, but i do put them differently and think about them in my own context in my own ways and in my own experience through my own experience of course another of course. Thir third disclaimer is that when i speak about language i want people to understand that i'm talking about any manner of way verbal way that people communicate effectively Anyway, okay. not because I'm trying to make this disclaimer is important to me because there's politics in the definition of language as well, okay. especially given our given our past uh, South Africa specifically. Right. And lastly, the last disclaimer I want to make is that when I speak about culture and language or or identity, specifically ethnic identity mm -hmm. in relation to language, right. I am not by any means saying that language is culture, but those two are closely, closely related, mm. but not at all that I'm claiming that mm. language is that culture. Okay, thank you So for those that. are the disclaimers I wanted to make. Okay. Mm. Okay, well, do, you wanna, do you wanna say something? Oh no, I was going to respond to your request. Whoa. Okay, yeah, go for it. Okay, because I was about to re-ask that question. Okay. Yeah. Now, why did I choose this so I named this, uh, so it has two titles, this discussion. Yes. I named it Zemkin Koma Gwalandini Thoughts on the Ultimate Archive of All Time. Right. And then the subtitle there is 
a discussion. Mm. Here's the richness of our heritage, mm -hmm. which is our language. And with those two titles, what I'm trying to show is that we're losing something of great value mm. in how we perceive our languages okay. or how we do not perceive our languages. Okay. Which, of course, will be the meat of this discussion, as I said. I'm very excited about this. I'm truly excited about this. Um, <laughs> I am too. Firstly, there's three parts to Akka's um, discussion that we're, well, rather how we're going to approach this. And the first part is language as a living archive. For me, that's the idea of we almost have this like storage and this data source of um, material from our ancestors, our past, our forefathers, our foremothers, this library, this vault, this richness of who we are and where we came from. And we can access all those strings of the past through the way we engage in language. That's what I got from this, but we're here with the expert and we're going to ask Aka, what does this mean? What is this about? Okay. So when I think about language as, a, as, as, as an archive, mm. And this idea came to me, or rather this observation came to me around, say, 2027, 2016. Okay. When people were, during Fees Must Fall, Roads Must Fall, were really engaging on quite a number of things. And yeah. people were, some people were obsessed with this idea of archiving ourselves. And when I listened to people speaking about archives, and the only thing that would come up, my mind, I would say, Language, language, language yeah. okay. and which, of course, even when you speak about language or think about it philosophically, it is an archive. Mm. Because I mean, many scholars, your Gukis, your Pras, Kwesi Pra, particularly for me as a sociologist, but also looks at uh, South uh, rather African history. Right? Mm. He wrote a lot of African mm. history. Mm. Um, he he speaks about language as well, mm. and we realize that. Language really, you are nothing. You have never existed. Because you, you to, say that there. Yeah. You've never existed without language. Okay. Two, I have to ask this as a... Let's say I've never thought about this deeply and I hadn't read your words and we've never discussed this, which we have. So I get mm -hmm. a little bit of your thoughts. But you've never existed. What does that mean really? Uh -huh. So I, I'd like to start from the historical co uh, colonial uh, times right in south africa we may not be clear about that because somehow our languages as well as our cultures to some extent became resilient mm. but there are other post-colonial so uh, societies who whose language landscape mm. is only or mostly dominated by the language of those who colonized right we see that a lot, of course we see that a lot in in, in in French colonies, mm. particularly French colonies. And so there's a reason why when colonialists came to the places they colonized, mm. one of the first things they attacked, they wanted to erase is the language. Yeah. Because then they can tell your history, distort it, lie about it and all of that. Yes. You know what I mean? Because without language, there is no evidence that you were actually interested about the sky. Mm. Therefore, you never had an intellectual ability. Mm, mm, Without mm. language, you do not, you've never had families. Mm. Without language, you've never had literature. Mm. Without language, you've never been interested in the, in the human condition. You've mm. never been interested in describing the complex human emotional state. Oh, wow. You have never been organized judicially, socially, economically so because through language it couches all of our reality right. through, through we name those things we name things we name, things. Sure. We name concepts we speak about concepts mm -hmm. we reason through language of course oh, go on. we develop through language yeah because by the time you build you thought you spoke mm. then you built right. so it was intentional that one of the first things that must be attacked in colonial societies is the language. In fact, yesterday, the Deputy Minister of, of Traditional Affairs went to the, to the launch I was at, um, at UWC, the center, they were launching the Center for African Language Teaching. Wow. EC course the center, called. Yeah. It's a center their education a faculty it's going to be focused on the teaching of his class or the training of his class teachers. Wow. 
And there's quite a few points I will make there. He he was one of the speakers and he gave a lesson on a geographical lesson yesterday on Imilambo of the Western Cape. Mm. And then he would mention Umlambo, a river in the Western Cape in his class and he would ask the audience, which which river is that? Wow. We didn't know many of those on Of course. This is river for the first time the first yesterday. Time. And then the point he was making, he says, it is through language that we know that Isizwe has long had nationhood before. Wow. Isizwe has long existed before our advent of colonialism. Absolutely. It's, it is through language that we actually see that among women in Kubekoyabo before they had culture, they had lives. You know what I mean? Yes. So that's why I made this claim that without language, you have never existed. There is no evidence. I mean, of course, if you actually want to, if we speak about recorded language mm. or coded language, mm -hmm. starting from hieroglyphics, today we understand the, his, the Egyptian history because the Egyptians decided to record their experiences, mm. to communicate their experiences yeah. for themselves as well as uh, for future generations. And we know that many con countries in Africa had that, but they were destroyed. I just, for some reason, I just said that I thought of Benin. And the huge kingdom and the palace that had all these beautiful um, archives and this beautiful art along the walls. And when the British, whether the British or was the French, was the French. Quite a number of them, actually. I don't know. <laughs> all of them. Belgians. All of them. I'm just trying to remember. Okay, I'll, I'll put it below because I don't want to get this wrong. Um, no, it was definitely the French. He's speaking about the Benin, it's most likely the British. But of course, we can double check that. Okay. I mean, but see, is that really necessary now? Because what we know is that something happened by someone. I, there's and a documentary on DW documentary, and I think I'll link it below because I watched it relatively recently. And the way they pillaged it, they just took it, they cut it down, not realizing that they were histories, yes. stories about their grandfathers, the way they cultivated the land, economics, the way they wrote, and it was art, but it was also the way they communicated and recorded their history, and that's just gone. Of course, without uh, confusing things though, or conflating things, because recorded or coded mm. communication is different from language, but of course they're very much connected. Mm. We code because we, can, we speak, right? right? But now for me, my biggest focus is actually what we speak. Well, so really the big is the bigger argument here that I'm making is that mm. without language you have never existed. I mean there's so many there's so much existent evidence now, everyday language that proves in fact one example um, is a, oh, I forget her now. She was interviewed by Nitsuki Mazwai. She's a doctor I think she's a sociologist might be wrong, but I'm gonna uh, double check it. She there is she makes a reference to this expression yes is in job it will never burn. What does that mean? Meaning, isn't that tet? Oh. If you want to fix things, let's sit down. It's tet mm -hmm. But that expression makes reference to the fact that in, in, in ancient uh, societies, African societies, societies, many, not only Zulu, the way that people address things, conflicts or whatever, mm. they would bring them to the court. Most likely, in course, in Kundjeni, there you go, which is a band. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, pa. Pa. and we can see. Mm. In, in fact, we'll see that in Amani, Amakalo, and in Neza, we see that in Neza. They are also historical. Yeah. Can, they give us a window to the life before mm. us. So, if without language again, in fact, again, I think what Tony Morrison says when she speaks about. Uh, oppression by white people, white supremacy. Mm. What oppressors do, they tell you that you have a, I'm not going to say it for, word for word here, you have a flat head or you have not, you do not have big enough brain. And then you're going to spend the next 20 years trying to prove that while one of them are busy developing themselves, building uh, sophisticated economic systems, and when you are still trying to prove your worth and your humanness, it's exactly not the language, okay? Because once you strip away from our language, you've taken everything, our intellectual history, our, our, your. I just got so triggered much. for some reason. I just remembered, sorry, I'm going to be saying this. 
I just remembered a conversation I had with someone from high school. If you know, if you watch this and you know who you are, you know what happened. Mm -hmm. Because I'll just, I won't tell the whole thing, but it was basically a situation where um, I then asked, after we were having a conversation, something was happening, and I just asked why, why this person was from the Eastern Cape, by the way, um, not far from where I grew up, not too far, a couple towns away. Dambu's but why don't you learn is closer like okay you grew up with, around it your friends are closer um they claim that they were english and um they might have studied after class asked why not is close and they were like my grandparents were over there it's not really something we do and the way that dismissed i don't know why i just thought of that it was such a dismissive thing you know we were we were in the same house darling if you see this <laughs> it's just like a thing and everything you've said, okay, we've already gotten into Aka's second point, which is about the perception of language and how we are a victim of a colonizer. Oh my days, and we're champions of our colonizers by not embracing, I guess, our language yes. and connecting it to heritage. <sighs> this is a lot to kind of think about. I don't think I've ever been challenged hectically to think about it in this way of course our parents do especially if you grew up in a predominantly well um african household where your parents really instill the need for speaking your language mm -hmm. um, the kai river was never called that mm -hmm. there's a place called kunubi and uh, in east london my uncle told me that why well, it's not that was it kunubi and apparently, that's why people call him because he's not if I'm not yes. saying wrong. And he was like, the English and the, I don't know if it's Afrikaans, but let's just say Amangis could not uh, pronounce it because they called it Gnubi. That is a whole entire conversation on its <laughs> own when it comes to language issues. Listen, <laughs> like I'm thinking about, for instance, we also say, no, we can have Kuha, we said Kuha, but we can have Kuha. It's the same with Nanaka. There's a place called Nanaka. They make great pies, but that's not what it was called. And also, by the way, do you see, I want you to see the extent of these things. They seem like they're nothing. Mm. But the extent to which they strip us of who we are. Yeah. As well as, well, for instance, in case there's a place called Tongat. No, I think Tongat. That is the season. Oh, oh Tongat. Hectic! It's the name of the river. H is definitely. This the river. This river. Ilulu Tongati. Wow. You know what I mean? Meaning, oh my day. Because we get value from it, we also give it value. Because we, we value it, we use it, and therefore we bestow value to it. Age is definitely to this, to that, even, even in the way it's written. I'm like, oh my god. Oh my day. So these things are not really, they're not as 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 mean. I don't know These are things that's really who we are. And they are very emotive girls. <laughs> parents um oh my days this is so funny so my parents um generation um my my mom's name my mom has an english name um she has her closer name as well same with my grandma and her and um, her husband my grandpa and 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 when it came to us our whole generation um my mom's kids my mom started having children in my dad in the 1970s mind you i know i was born in 95 but like <laughs> the whole like line um is all of us it's actually crazy and i've asked my mom why they did that and they just they offered this information in small bits it's not like they were educating us to sit us around and be like yay 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 this is what you should do no like that it was more like no the problem is um we weren't allowed really to have our names because they were too hard to pronounce so you had to have a christian name Remember what's my name? Don't prevail on your missing please. The poem by what's it? What did he say? Like, forget his name. Oh my god, this is so wrong. It's okay. Well, 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 yeah, well, 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 he said wrong. I think yeah. it's wrong. Please, guys, please correct me. We'll I put it down below when we get yes, when this airs. But the, my name is Hectic. No, I'm prevail on your missing please. That is a that is so long name. No, no. So the way we did, I reminded me, it reminds me of that poem. 
That's it's very crazy. simple but very profound. I'll link it here and I'll probably write it in the description box and Aka will provide that. Okay, cool. Oh my days. I think you're just opening up my heart and my mind. This kind of feels like a therapeutic discussion. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm so glad to say that. Yeah. I don't so, know. <laughs> I was expecting this. <laughs> yeah. So with the first segment, I just wanted us to really shallowly, because that was very shallow. We can speak for days on that segment yeah. of the stripping of our archive, you know. But it was introductory, giving the history behind it. But of now, course. can we hold ourselves accountable? Okay. All of us. All of us. I mean, we are the example of this and of of exactly what we're talking about, even at this moment. Because is it? Ah, it's so mean. It's so hectic. I mean, it's so hectic. 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 It's so It's so It's It's I'm a colonizer, okay? It's idioms and what are they called in English? I don't know. I only know I'm a colonizer. <laughs> it's an idiom and a proverb, whatever. Yes, one of the, some, all those things. Proverbs, but there's yeah. something called ingibi, ifa gamans. Ingibi amans, ifa gamans. When you translate it, it literally means a doctor of water, an expert of water dies by water. It's kind of that idea of like um, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Um, so what you do is who you are. You, can you realize how difficult it is to translate? Um, I have a partner and he um, is Zulu and often doubt, eh, I'll say something and he's like, huh? Because it's <laughs> such a tonal language. Mm -hmm. How do I describe that? Ibandanga. <laughs> but this is because as a general about no one now as a Muslim, they must have. I'm sure they have, but it's like, similar. It's so kind of... hard to translate to someone who doesn't speak your language. Um, it's toilet poop. What about if it's toilet poop or something like that? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's. I'm not going to dog English. I love the English language when I was studying it in high school, but it's such a simplistic language. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> but also, we're, we're not here to attack people's language. I am. I'm but, sorry about the English. But but I mean, the, the point that I'm trying to. Make I am, friend. I'm sorry because everything you've said is exposing how like disconnected sometimes mm. I am from my own language. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, you go on. But I mean, that, that's I'm, I'm so glad you say that because that's what I, I'm particularly happy that you use the word disconnected because here I used alienated. Okay. And of course, it's important that we must hold the system, and when I say the system, I mean our past, our colonial system, the current system, in fact, as well, the status quo. But also, we must also hold ourselves accountable as individuals, as families, as, as communities, as black institutions. We do have institutions, church, schools. You know, as Abanabel Zamasiko, Amasiko are done through institutions, uh, this course. Uh, and, and by the way, no, 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 I'm focusing on Amakosa here, guys, because we're going to and we're going to so I can speak from that experience. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm we challenging everyone. We are planning to everyone, everyone. yeah. yeah, yeah so too, I'm, I'm challenging yeah, everyone. Swahili, whatever. I feel very, I feel that actually a lot of you could would actually um, relate to this conversation. Mm -hmm. So, I, uh, a line here I wrote to this part, I said, we are the victims of our colonizers, but we are the champions of our colonizers. Damn. We alienate ourselves from our languages. Hectic. And uh, let me start off by this example. The first way we alienate our, ourselves from our example, from our languages, is <laughs> we anthropologize our languages or, or exotify oh my our languages. Let me give you an example. Trevor Noah, I'm not attacking Trevor Noah, I like him, but as I said, we must hold ourselves accountable. Trevor Noah, I think it was one of the, close to one of his last few shows on his daily show. And then he was celebrating the Women's Month at that time. And then he goes on, of course, in what he was saying, goes on to mention the famous expression, Watinda Bafaz, Watinda Bogodo. 
go, I don't know what he said. What did I have first? What did you do? And I said to myself, what? Oh, man. It's available online, guys. You don't believe me? Please go check it out. It's there. We love you, Trevor. We love you, but And to me, I, 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 I was so sad. Yeah. Why? Yeah. This is somebody who was raised by a closer woman. Yeah. He is closer. But he speaks it fluently. He doesn't. I'm guessing he does, but maybe he's just like forgotten since he's been in the States. I don't know, I'm not speaking for and, him. And you're actually going to a point I was going to go to that Trevor now often tells us that he's quite fluent in a number of South African languages. Yeah. How often do we hear him speak them? Mm. And when he does, what is his level of competence in those? This is interesting. And there's not an attack to him, but... It's it's a matter of we must think about this critically. Then I have to ask you a question. I'm going to come. Can you please allow me to finish this thought? Because there's a point I'm trying to go to. Okay. What I saw in the context of the West and the, in the audience, in yeah. the Western audience, yeah. it played right directly in the status quo of the West, that of anthropologizing us as African people, especially through language as well. Mm. That to me it says, you know. One, you, 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 you are in this show that has all the resources that could have done a simple test, Google sh uh, search to see what is that expression. But you go jump and put in clicks in an expression that has no clicks. To me, I couldn't help that thing of because when people from out from the West, when they look at our languages, they start. He said, oh my God, so wonderful. Oh, the clicks, you must teach me the clicks. Because apparently our languages are so limited to just a few sounds in them, as if their language is without any intellectual value or any other value oh beyond the clicks. God. You're making it sound like it's a circus, it's a zoo. That's how I find, hence I'm using the word, this exotification or anthropologization. Because it is, because if you remember mm. the, the birth of anthropology as a field, it was a colonial project that white people became so arrogant and understood themselves as the standard of, of humanness mm. that therefore they must study these indigenous people mm. in Asia, in Africa, mm. in South America because we are so less than human, we need to be understood, to be studied. Hence, oh everything became so exotic about us, so, including our language. So stripping humanity, you're making me think of the human zoos they had in Germany. There you go. All over England. There's currently, if you have, again, I, I love DW documentary. I don't know why I'm giving them a shout out. It's not like a sponsor. <laughs> but um, there's a great documentary on German Africans. Um, African Germans, I, whatever. I saw it. Yes. I saw it. And human zoos and like how they were prevalent literally up until like the 19th century. Like this is not long ago. Even in the early 20th century, some existed. But what I wanted to ask um, on this Trevor Noah point, but it's not just about Trevor Noah. <clears throat> Two things. How then do we get held accountable? And I'm explaining this because Trevor is speaking to a broad audience of people, right? And you've also said, like, how often has he used Isikosa or any other South African languages that he can speak? That's the one point. How can you do that, right? It's a very simple thing, but I think maybe i think we need to explore that and then okay. why also because at the same time we now live in this like anglophone world a lot i mean fact, for wherever you are in the world depending on your your setting and we have to assimilate and learn these languages that we're working with if you're in france you must go i have a friend now who just moved to france they don't even tolerate people speaking english that much in the region where he is um and people have and and and, and the colonizers come and they expect you to uphold like the French identity, where you are. So how and why then? Firstly, I do not mean to be unreasonable about Trevor. I cannot make him so responsible of things that are so big. It's a structural problem. No, 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 it's of structural. course. I'm just using him but as I'm an example. I'm using it as an example. Of course, of course. As, as a reflection of ourselves, by the way. I'm not attacking him. I'm attacking us. I'm yeah. holding us, all of us, accountable. Yeah. Oh, on. Now, of course, I don't want to be unreasonable. Oh, Trevor is addressing a broader yeah. international Nancy. Even um, us here in this yes, conversation. International audience. But if you're going to tell, to tell the story of a people to a point where you want to use some expression of them, make it a point that you're going to say correctly, especially because we're always telling all of these audiences that mm. actually I know quite a number of South African languages. Right. You even go as far as saying, and we're not going to pretend as if, because even linguistically it's explained, we understand this, we're not going to pretend as if we do not understand the influence of, of, of children burying and nurturing people's influence in the language of the children. There are many yeah. studies that speak that. 
when have we heard? And that's why I go as far as saying, "Who can tell this is possible and this is not?" Now I because I think also it would actually drive home the point that he's making about himself, hey, how South African hey, he is. Hey, and hey. and of course, I guess you all might tell you, "Sure, Africa is because of one banda." But this guy comes to South Africa. He has a YouTube channel. There are certain things he speaks to South African audiences only about. Interesting. Why are you not interested? Again, again, I said well, I'm holding us accountable because this example. Mm. We're just using him because he's a very powerful and influential figure. Ukuve, how cute it is, and I cringe. And oh, said, no. and I cringe, and and we saw, and and, and I said the same time. because can look not guys toss and sans. Oh no! Was by such a oh moment. Oh, no. It's not an oh moment. It's an embarrassing moment. But oh, also, okay, man. I'm going to catch you, man, to bruise you, but I'm also going to soothe you. Mm. How am I going to soothe you? You are a victim as much as you're a champion today, but you're a victim. Fair. Because you'll remember again, going back to my first, uh, to my first point, yeah. that there's this book, I forgot the name, What just following the, the birth of white supremacy, particularly in America in the 1600s. You better remember it. We'll put a check. I will look, I will look, I will look up for it, I will look for it. And by the way, these things, guys, it's not like I came unprepared. It's just that long no call is easy, though, know, they come up your mind right at the moment while you are having a conversation. Yeah, and they do. So, please. And it looked at the, the birth of white supremacy. And I didn't read, I just, like, took some parts from it and the review and all of that. But what I got from that book is how white supremacy was born in America and all of that. It's right, hours. right. And I started thinking about how in the context of South Africa, how white supremacy is, and how it really found its way to in comfort and all, in comfort and all of that. Mm. I realized the greatest thing that white supremacy did in South Africa mm. is to take the idea of humanness and intertwine it, while at the same time it took blackness and made it its very antithesis that is, blackness is the very antithesis of whiteness. Therefore, if you are going to intertwine whiteness with humanness, and as whiteness, mm. your antithesis is blackness, therefore, blackness is not human enough. It's not human. Blackness is the very antithesis of humanness. I mean, it even comes through in English. Yeah. Yes, you can make arguments that, well, English is so powerful in South Africa, therefore it gives you opportunities. But it goes beyond that. Because even in our context as black people, when we speak as guests, we feel, oh my God, the worth. We feel, we feel human hey, enough. The closer we are to English, not only the language, but also the way of being, uh, in fact, of course, whiteness in this case, including language, of course. Yeah. I mean, we cannot pretend as if we don't see ourselves, how we look at, how we look at ourselves. Sure. To the Intelligence degree. is measured there by the way go. you speak. And I'm so glad you say the way you speak the language. It's not only just the fact that you speak the language, English, but the I'm way I'm like cringing speak. because I just thought of a hundred examples. There you go. So that's why I'm saying we are also, and, I, and, and I'm, I'm so glad that this language, this conversation, by the way, is just a part of a broader conversation because it's part of a theme that defines who we are as a post-colonial society, as a post-colonial people. Because I'm reminded of another conversation as well, a UD, online UD lecture by Professor Zetuma mm. She gave this put a link. Yes. And please, I really encourage people to go on. Uh, it's a UD Similane lecture. You, just a little bit of background. UD Similane was a, a lesbian woman in KZN. I think she also played for Bafana Bafana. She was murdered on grounds of hate crime by people that he knew from his community, or at least one of them. He, she knew. And then okay, that lecture was established in her honor. And also, of course, to advance queer people's struggles and all mm. of that. And the professor Zitmati was, was speaking in that lecture about the origins of violence in mm. South Africa and the experience of violence by marginalized people, particularly women as well as queer people. And we are um, where it comes from. Mm. The extreme, the kind of violence we have in South Africa was established right at the beginning. Mm. of this colonial society mm. when the indigenous met the colonizer right 
And of course, she makes reference to this metaphor that people often use of the raping of the land. Mm. And she like Tibani is like you know, with a violent, you know, uh, expression. Which, she says, if if you could rape a land, what a resource, the, the ultimate resource. Therefore, that means everyone, everything, and everyone else on it is already raised. Speaking. You know what I mean? The emasculation of the African man. And together with women, it was a given. Mm. When you look at the levels of violence meted against black women, particularly by black men, mm. we are colonizing ourselves. If you look at the origin of the violence, we. So again, it's the same theme, even in the language as well. I just thought about Mahmoud Mandani. There you go. How he writes about violence, perpetuating violence. He writes there about the state level, go. about like the colonizer was violent and brutalized, and then these people like Idi Amin who come into power do the same thing, repeat the patterns of learned behavior. So, woo, it's, 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 it's so same, interconnected. It's these themes that you find in our experience, even. Is this thing that you find in our experience in post-colonial South Africa, mm, but in, mm, even in mm, different mm, things? Mm, and I was speaking about violence, mm, and I was speaking about language. Mm, of course, we speak about violence because language has been subjected to violence, intellectual violence, wow, and other kinds of violence. Wow. As well. And as you see, in, in violence on its own, yeah. we perpetuate ourselves as much as we're victims, even in language as well, we're doing exactly the same. How we feel so comfortable to guys and sons is cause. It's such an all moment. It's just an all moment. That part. Yes, I don't know why I just thought of like how we glorify and like, oh my god, they're so exceptional. Exactly. When um, a, a white a person in South Africa can speak um, any of the language they can speak Zulu or whatever. And it just goes back to the idea of it was not meant to be human. We it was a it was just like a project to study these we were like things in zoos. We were like, don't, what is the word you use? Exoticized. Yeah. So it's like, oh, it's exotic that this white person can speak. Uh, it's Tulsa fluently. As if you are not in South Africa or you are not in Eastern Cape, or with Rochester, or Trichester Zulu fluently, KZN, da. Of course, you must. Of course, you should. You are in KZN. Eh? But that was not the point, as you. As Aka has mentioned over and over again, the idea was to strip all of that identity. There you go. And that includes language. There you go. Wow. So, so but also, I must, as I said, I'm not making this an academic thing, and also those who have called No, make it academic. Will, it's will, true. Yeah, we will we'll come back, but, but, I want to make this disclaimer. I'm very much aware that there is an observation that, in fact, it's not an observation, it's a fact that there are choices that are made. You know, even children, in fact, there's, there's evidence that it shows children who are exposed to multiple languages, they also make their choices but of their language. Different. There you go. I was coming, like, because I was making this point so that But we're not going to pretend as if... It's happening in a vacuum. In a vacuum. Yes, there's agency and influence. That agency is influence. Mm. It's influence. You cannot not be influenced by something as old as... Oh, I mean, this this status quo is as old as our colonial history. Woo! So, yes, wow. I understand there are those choices, but come on, they are influence. Look, we're running out of time, but I do, before we wrap up, want you to briefly touch on this um, last bit you wrote about on technicalities. Okay. Well, this one is really just, you know, me having fun. It's things I think about, you know, <laughs> I think about as someone who's obsessed with language. Right. And as I said, when I say language, in my case, I'm very much interested, in fact, my biggest interest is the development of African languages, South African languages, to mainstream level. Okay. You know? Okay, I didn't know That's that. my That's... biggest, biggest dream ever. I wish for a day where you take your child to UCT Medical School and they open their anatomy textbook and it's in its class, in its school, to mm. its, or any medical school. The day you go to a court and all the court proceedings can happen in any language you Just want. Just like how they do it You do not have the interpreters. Exactly. Yeah, you want to learn that? Uh, that, was, that is my biggest of all dreams. Biggest the of all dreams. dreams that will happen. You know what I mean? But yeah, the technicalities, I just wanted to discuss, you know, also, it's also a little bit connected to the idea of language as an archive. Yeah. Because we often think of the technical aspects, what you call grammar, okay, as 
this abstract thing that's separate from language as we speak it, the meaning for the semantic aspect right, of language. Right, right, right. So I wanted to, an observation that, of course, I'm not the only one who's made it, there are paid people who've written before me, uh, written by Kim Nike. I was, I, I, in fact, I got to know that people have written of, of, about it uh, because I had observed it in my okay. own circle. And I realized, by the way, people had already observed it and wrote about it. I don't know if you guys are noticing, but so there's a in, in, in languages that are governed by noun classes. Okay. There's a phenomenon that has been in, observed, but not so much in Southern African languages. Okay. This thing of collapsing of noun classes together. Okay. For instance, it's happening right now. I actually see it on, on Facebook. I saw a post recently on Facebook. Um, you want you know that jokes is got Facebook where two Mwabandu they come up with dialogues. Okay. You know? This dialogue that's written umyut. Um kile, um ya buse. Mama, I just know um musho. Um ya pen lati. Hi mama, cheta kaxe please. Ah! And you're like, what? You know. Okay. You know. Yeah. And okay. it's actually happening. It's actually happening because there's a collapse there of noun class three into noun class one, as we see with the M M okay. argument. Because noun class three, as much as they are very, they are the same as um prefixes but in their argument they're not the same. I think you need to explain that. Okay. So noun class I'm not sure cause noun class one is um and that uh, that noun class accommodates person entities your um to um fundi see um and all of that. And then noun class three it's all the nouns that start with um that are prefixed with um that are not yes, this is class grade eight. <laughs> that, yeah there you go that are not people grade eight class <laughs> you'll say you'll hear um musho um chi and all of that and when you create an argument for melani is saying of, of those nouns when you create the you, you, in english called argument or concord verb or, uh, the verbal or concord it's different for both noun classes you'll say um to um, so to, uh, yes, but I don't want that one because it drops the M. Ah, but that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a root. That's also. But anyway, Kulena, let's use this one. Umkile. If you mean the umosho is the thing that was eaten, you will say umkile. You will say you will not say umkile. Yeah, umbona umkile. Oh, you think it's the evolution of language, though. you know what I mean? And by the way, the reason Maybe why it's evolution and the way, like even in English, things are there. You go. Words now are just used as languages. Riz is a word in the dictionary. Do you know that? You <laughs> now the question again: This archive kind of thing. Why are we accepting it? Why do we understand it so clearly? Why are we so easily observing it in English? Because we see what it means about our times and it cha the changes of time and all of that. Why can't we observe it in our languages? It's because again we don't understand them as actual languages that actually are leaving as archives right now. Wow. Because when you actually see these differences most of the time, they happen in particular context. In fact, such differences, these, these these variations or these changes are happening in urban areas. That is telling us more about what is happening with the people who speak these languages. That's so interesting. And if there's such a change that is along with time, that is a change that is along that's going along with times. Right. Why then do we think that these languages are not changing? Why these languages are not leaving? Mm. Because they are recording the history, the time as English is doing. I mean, there was a time "bullicious" never used to be a word, but it even ended up because of Beyonce and pop culture. It ended up. It ended up on the Oxford Dictionary. Yeah. Because they take it, so they take their languages seriously as well as their evolution. Why were we not? And of course, this is a very technical really example. Cool. It's a very technical example. There are, many other, about, yeah. there are many other examples that are not examples that actually, you know, we use every day. I can't think of them now. Yeah. In fact, in my honors, I was actually looking at the interaction of it's closer in English. How given if, how, how, if given enough time, a new language can, can come out of that. Because I, had, I was observing that code switching, or rather the interaction of these two languages is not only at the level of terminology or lexicon as we call it in, mm. in, in, in linguistics, yeah. it's actually even informed by rules, unique rules. And these rules are not just, okay, code switching informed by Istosa rules mm. or English rules. No, there are a few rules that when you follow, for instance, when I observed the double pluralization that happens, mm -hmm. for instance, the colleagues, 
you hardly ever hear people pluralizing one mm. in the plural. Ne, it's a plural. Colleagues, English plural. Mm. There's in my interviews I realized, but when you say things like that and you drop one mm. plural, mm. there seems to be a sense of incompleteness. Mm. In fact, when you drop less cause, it becomes incredibly ungrammatical to the person who says it. Mm. But when you drop less in case, it ne seems colleague, inco- yeah, it seems incomplete. Weird, yeah. Do you know what? So, uh, so those are the things that are happening. I mean, yeah. okay, Dallas says the isha. A suffix mm. that we attach to verbs as well as um, as some adjectives, but particularly to verbs, <laughs> It's a thing. It's a you know thing. I mean? yeah. So uh, again, this idea of a language is an archive, and if we do not pay attention to it, by the way, another thing that I wanted to, as a last point, mm. in that in that conversation, that idea of you know anthropologizing our languages, I don't know if you've noticed we. <laughs> Again, it's in line with the fact that we do that with so much of who we are. For instance, I'm sorry, UWC and the center. Thank you for inviting me, but there were maybe it will be seen to it will be me part. I'm like, we really it's like we visit who we are. We 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 keep these identities and our languages in the box and sometimes we visit ourselves. That's simply because it didn't have an excuse, must not be me part. One of the speakers there, but into something that was very intellectual, he was not even being things such things that would elicit praise singing. Praise singing, there you go. Ubonga is, is what would elicit you know, elicit or solicit. But the moment you the church is and I was so confused to like Mm. Why is it? Because that's how alienated from who we are we are. That we look at ourselves from someone else's eyes. Wow. We exotify ourselves. Sure, we've added our own selves. Okay, you yeah, want to put it that way? When you put it that way, and okay, yeah. <laughs> Listen, Thank you for the one who did that. Listen, we're going to continue this conversation on Patreon because Aka has so much more to say, but we have to wrap up over here. Aka, firstly, thank you for this conversation. Thank mm-hmm. you for being here. This mm-hmm. was so much fun and so enriching. And I feel like I've just had a, like a release that I didn't expect on a Thursday afternoon today. I didn't expect this was going to take me there, this conversation. So thank you for your generosity and just your candor and offering like how much we need to like introspect as a people. Um, so thank you. Thank you, darling. No, no, because <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy in, in Brazil. Like, yeah. um, again, thank you. I'm noticing something that we're both doing. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, we're doing we, we, Thank we you so much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> listen, we're going to continue this conversation over on Patreon. Please, please, please um, comment below. Ask um, any questions. Aka will be more than happy to answer them. Um, any questions and comments you might have, share this widely. Please subscribe. It really helps the channel grow. Like, do all those things to support the community and join us over at Patreon. And we'll see you next time. Bye! You see, well, the point I'm making is that can we imagine how far in our hidden with our families and our parents oh, right. if we were using what they understand their language? Because these languages have these resources inside of them, these resources that we're looking for in English, that we have in English, because we have these terms that become sure. holding space, when actually holding space was already contained in Swarayana. Wow.